Welcome everybody uh, to the book launch of uh, Europe N14, Productive Amsterdam. Um, need some clarification perhaps. <laughs> um, at this moment, uh, AIR and the, uh, European, the Dutch European Foundation, together with the municipality of Rotterdam, and, and six of our uh, private partners are, have kick-started the European 15 Productive Rotterdam edition. So it, we thought it would be wise to learn from our friends in Amsterdam. Uh, since they have uh, sought for the new mixed-use live-work neighborhoods of the future for over two years through uh, the design research of uh, Europa uh, as a pan-European design competition. And it has arisen all kinds of interesting results. Uh, we feel we should celebrate, uh, but perhaps that's an Amsterdam thing to do. Uh, but also we should learn from that. And, and I think that's also uh, what the competition, in, in whatever way it plays out, should always deliver to us is a learning, a learning experience. So, so this is why we invited uh, uh, our friends from the European Foundation and the city of Amsterdam to come to Rotterdam and present the book here. So we're very happy that they, they did, they choose to, to do so. And uh, so welcome everybody from the city of Amsterdam, perhaps a bit of old school, but a show of hands, who's from, uh, who's from the Amsterdam municipality? Okay, so <laughs> welcome everybody. Um, before we uh, represent the book, which is of course uh, also a very happy moment for uh, everybody who worked on it, uh, just short introduction on the Rotterdam edition. Uh, we felt that as Amsterdam does, we are in search of the live-work neighborhoods of the future. Uh, because we feel that at the cutting edge of, let's say, public values and spatial design, there lies the future of our cities. And um, it's about being a healthy city, it's about searching for sustainability and circularity, and how to go about shaping cities through these principles uh, in our own time. It's about inclusion and making sure that everybody in the city has opportunities to thrive and to build talent. Uh, it's about productivity in a broader sense of the word, so a great theme from the European, uh, European competition to centralize that theme, because it's about working, it's about learning, it's about taking care of each other, it's about living productive lives in a broader sense. So uh, how to go about and shape a city that invites you to do so and that uh, offers you the opportunities to, to live a productive life. So this is what we're looking for. Um, for Rotterdam, it's, uh, it's an opportunity, as it is for many other cities, to connect promising design talent to forward-thinking clients. Uh, this is the tradition of Europe, I feel. And secondly, it's also an opportunity to test our vision for the future. It has a complicated name, it's called Omgevingsvisie, and I tried to translate that. The <laughs> best I can say is like a vision and a regulatory framework wrapped in one, so something like that. For our British uh, and English speaking guests. So uh, in short, this is what, what we are doing. Um, um, so we thought, well, let's learn from Amsterdam. We're also in the midst of our own competition. In a month from now, uh, uh, the teams that are competing for European 15 have to turn in their uh, propositions. And uh, in, the, in, in the final part of this year, we start reviewing them. And then we want to, as soon as possible, open up the debate. Uh, so we, are, we won't only talk about the five or ten best plans. We want to talk about every submission. We want to make sure that everybody is visible. We want to talk about that, learn from that, and move forward. And so we've built a program that ends about this time next year with a conference. And, uh, and we will, would like to invite everybody to be a part of that. Uh, but because we are a part of a competition, uh, we have cameras because we feel that everybody, everything that we learn in this, uh, in this period, we should also record and share. So uh, please, if you have a contribution, and be invited to, uh, to participate, uh, talking to the microphone so that everybody can hear you, and we can share what is exchanged here. So in short, my introduction. We have, uh, I think, a very proud group of people. Uh, first of all, uh, our friends from European uh, Foundation in the Netherlands, uh, Madir Shah, who will be presenting uh, a short personal story, I think, uh, in a while. Uh, Jonathan Woodruff, um, who together with uh, Madir uh, worked tirelessly on the book. I uh, will be presenting it uh, to uh, Sabine Lebesque, who is here from uh, the city of Amsterdam, as a principal client we agreed on. 
Um, this is what we would do first. Then we are going to review uh, what was learned in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the past competition, what's in the book. So there's images of the competition submissions. There's winners in the room. So uh, who's a winner from the past edition? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we had the opportunity to, to, to get to know some of you uh, earlier this year. It's, it's great to have you involved as well in Rotterdam. Uh, so this is what we're going to do second, then we're going to talk to some of the jury members. So Matthijs van Ruyve, who is uh, also our partner in Rotterdam, as our uh, chief urban designer, I have to say, for the city of Rotterdam, who juried the E14 edition. Uh, we have Ruud Gietema, who was in the jury. Welcome, Ruud. Uh, we have, um, let's say, I, I was expecting the chairman, he's perhaps still traveling, uh, um, Bjarne Masterbroek. Um, he'll be joining uh, in a bit, perhaps. Uh, so uh, uh, this is this is thing very good to have Rotterdam-based jury members also uh, be available here to to share with us what they've learned in the previous edition. Uh, the book is also uh, a very interesting uh, 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 collage of articles learning about productive city. Zef Hemel wrote one of them. So uh, welcome, Zef. Uh, we were reflecting on what's in the article and trying to get from you what you wrote down, so we don't have to read it. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Christian Barret, over from Brussels. Welcome in Rotterdam, uh, Christian. Um, working tirelessly also in, uh, in Brussels to get this productive city going and also to make sure that on the long term we keep it there. Uh, we keep blue color, we keep white color. So we're keen to learn from you uh, how are you working in, uh, in Brussels on that uh, theme. Uh, and Erik uh, van der Kooi from the city of Amsterdam. Here he is, Erik. Uh, who is studying with his colleagues also the typologies of productive city or even the urban block, the new urban block. So he will take us through what they've been learning in Amsterdam and we will take that with us for our Rotterdam challenge. So in the end we'll review shortly uh, uh, what we're doing in Rotterdam and feed forward uh, from what we've learned together with our uh, colleague here from the municipality of Rotterdam and our, some of our private partners. And then we'll wrap up at uh, 9.30 sharp plus 10 minutes. So. Uh, Thank you. Um, my dear, uh, a personal story, right? Uh, kind of. Because I have to keep it. You can take my. Um, I have to keep it light. Um, so I have a question. So, who has an iPhone and after it fell down, who repaired it? The screen. Is there anybody? Yourself? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I had a situation like that, and I googled it, and uh, I found in Amsterdam some young person who would say 25 euro, and I thought, okay, let's go to this young person. So I end up in the Kracht, uh, very nice house, front room, back room, double doors, fantastic. He had 500 iPhones or phones, and the opa, a grandfather, they were repairing this. So that's like three years ago. And I said, like, why are you doing this? The guy said, yeah, I was not, I was a sort of a nerd. I'm smart, I'm really bad. I'm socially not really with the people. Um, so I like to do this. Um, three years later, the guy um, tried to do something in China. At the end, he has a company, he's a CEO of a company in India building uh, screens for all kind of phones. So why I tell you this story, for, for me it is a kind of a question that, um, and that was done under the Indian government's policy of make in India. So that's why it's very, very fast. Um, what is its relation to this book? Uh, it's a small anecdote which says, why do we need to produce uh, here in Holland? How do we produce and if we produce, is there any way um, we can be prepared from the city side, from the designer side, from, from all kind of participants? And uh, um, this guy's name was Alex and he failed because he could not rent any space. He was even hiring Chinese people, but he could not pay that. Finally, he moved somewhere else. Um, this is my little anecdote to just, just kind of give a, give a frame to what we are talking about. 
Uh, Jonathan, uh, who is a uh, co-editor, is going to uh, describe, and slowly we will discover the book the uh, rest of the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Madea. <laughs> just just to, um, to continue the iPhone story, I had my notes on my iPhone, but the battery's flat, so I'm going <laughs> to... So I'm going to improvise now on uh, why I'm standing here. Um, I think the, uh, the book. The book is kind of the end of a very unique uh, experience, I have to say. When we restarted um, European NL three years ago, we really wanted to do something different. Um, it's the first time in the history of European, so that's, let's say, 26, 27 years that European just works with one, with one client, one city. Um, so that was al already a unique uh, and, and different kind of fresh way in which we thought European could work in a more sort of professional, collaborative way with the clients that we, we have. And so we, we, we wanted to make a book which uh, represents more this, this collaboration it's not just about a sort of catalog of, of winning ideas, but it's much more a manual which can be used and, and looked at to, to gain, let's say, inspiration, but also a manual to help the, the Gemeente and the Amtenars within the Gemeente to, to, to kind of foster more thinking about this particular subject. That was, that's an important point for us. So in this sense, um, it's not really a coffee table book, of course, we're here to actually present the winning schemes, and that's in the book. But also we're here to, in the, in, within the book, to actually present a number of very interesting articles which Bas has just kind of introduced everybody, so I don't really need to do that. And I think having sat with Zef on his table this evening, I think there's going to be some interesting conversations on even the word productivity and how relevant that is in, in today's uh, urban situation. So. I just look forward to the conversation that's going to happen. And I would like to present to Sabine, our client, who has uh, been a really uh, helpful and very supportive throughout the process. Very, we've known each other for a very long time. When, in fact, I won European 3, so I'm giving away my age. And Sabine was working at the NIE, doing the publication for European 3 and European 4, which was also about our winning project in Manchester. So it's kind of the beginning of a circle. It's a bit like dark, if any of you have seen that on Netflix. It's kind of like you know, <laughs> round and round, and uh, very interesting to see where we continue with the European story and whether we, in fact, go back to Amsterdam uh, for another se session. So this is the book, Sabine. It's confusing because it's a different cover on the book that's on the thing, but this is the real book. So thank you very much for all your support. We've been really... <laughs> um, can you take a photo? Okay. Right. So thank you very much, and I hope everyone has a great evening tonight. Sabine, do you want to say a few? Yeah, shall I say something? Yeah, sure. Okay. We know each other since uh, 93, during the opening of the Netherlands Architecture Institute. And um, you were an architect uh, working at um, uh, Neutelings Riedijk Architect. And through Europan, you started your own office, which was S33, and you won several times European, and you're still involved. So it is an example how architects uh, working maybe in a bigger office and feel the need to escape from that and uh, have the qualities in them uh, to, to start an own career. And European is that platform for a long time to, uh, to, to provide that. Uh, but I, I was the commissioner for the five sites uh, for European, and it was an interesting um, moment when we started because you phoned me and said, I need somebody within the city council to, uh, to do these five sites. And I said, okay, that's me then, let's start. Um, and I'm really happy to have this book in my hands now 
because uh, as many as you know, there are several persons of the city of Rotterdam as well, and you have 15 to go now. Uh, having the locations, having your uh, assignment ready, and having the entries, and having the results in kind of copies um, laying on several tables uh, at the municipality, um, that that is that are all moments of 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 the the phases in which the European process is is going, but in the end you have to collect it all together and to have it in your hands. I'm um, so I, I really want to look into it and and to collect all these ideas because it's it's not only. Um, uh, uh, the entry, the, the, the finishing, the, the winners, but then it all starts and we have several winners here. It's not about that only moment, oh, yippee yay, I have the prize, but then it starts and you have to, the winners have to, uh, and the runners up as well, uh, have to find a way to, to make themselves useful for a big organization as a municipality to, to, to share their knowledge with the municipality. And that process is going on at the moment. Uh, it, it was difficult, but at the moment we have for the five sites a study commission or a follow-up. Um, uh, for one site, it's, it's the, the real assignment has to come, but everything is spoken out now. And that is, well, two years after, one and a half years after uh, we announced the winner. So it takes time. And having the book in the hand, that gives something uh, really practical to share around the ideas and to look into it and to also um, uh, enjoy all the other designs and mix them and so on. So thank you very much, Madir and Jonathan, for being resistant to keep everything going and for the writers, and thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you, Sabine. Please take a seat. I will distrib distribute some microphones because it's, we tried to do it without the stage today. So here you go. Um, I was going to ask you where you are at now, but you already shared some insights into that. Could you elaborate a bit more about this, 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 this phase after, uh, after celebrating who won? So everybody has a valuable pro proposition and some have to win. Uh, can you share a bit more insight into how, how it operates, that, that phase after winning and then, and then some? Mm -hmm. We're not part of it. Perhaps you can do. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is with the five locations in Amsterdam, they are all really, really different. And although there's one commissioner, that is the city of Amsterdam, the situations behind the scenes are uh, totally different. Uh, different and also during time and during the competition they have changed. So we had to deal with every location uh, for other things. And let me uh, take one, uh, maybe the last one uh, that still has needs the commission. We had, we thought that was a perfect situation. We had a media school and they wanted to extend and they were willing to collaborate with us and we thought perfect we have some productivity around in the media scene, uh, students, uh, copying, printing, whatever. And uh, during, uh, when the competition was just out, it's, it, it worked out that they really were not collaborating with us because there were other agendas that were more important than the European agenda. And um, so we missed our stakeholder and we knew that already during the process of having the, the, the competitions entering. And it was still for a long time, but because uh, I could all the time go back to the project team and saying, well, we have a commitment to make to Europan to give the winners a, a real study commission or anything, but we have to, to have a follow-up. Uh, I pushed it well, quite a lot, and Madir was helping with that as well. And now we, we, give, uh, we can give the, the winners and the runners-up uh, a commission for the site next to this Media College site, where we have the similar problems, but we... And, uh, but so it, it's changing during the time. And, um, for example, at Papa for Driehoek, Giovanni is here. 
is from the winning team uh, that won there. It's a very difficult uh, area with a, lit a little bit of criminal environment it is at the moment. Uh, so we really, as a city, want to push the, the process of developing the area. But in the meantime, the process of making an urban plan and renew that urban plan, it's taking a long, long time. And uh, all the time they say, oh, a few months, but then it's another few months and so on. So that's an ongoing process. At that location we have a stakeholder as well and he is getting very nervous because the prices go up every time his his sight is diminished to another 10 meters in inwards so it it is difficult but on the same time you have to really believe in the power of the design that the entries of Europe have delivered to to use that to make such slow process of urban planning uh, well more so, so realistic. Like, more, just yeah. to get a feel for it, who, who's partnering? So, so you have the city of Amsterdam, you have uh, the best young designers that there are, and then you have perhaps other partners as well, just to get a feel for the, for the process. Um, for the five locations, there were two where we had the stakeholder. Well, one, the media collation was off the table already, and the other location was uh, Papa Driehoek, where we have a private developer who owned some positions and they uh, promised during the process we will give a commission to the winners. But actually we as the city of Amsterdam were the commissioners for the European competition. Okay. And for the other three locations these are um, urban planning uh, uh, issues where we as a city gave a follow-up for uh, development. Yeah. And, and uh, perhaps content-wise or you know, to, deep in, to dive into the the submissions itself. What what surprised you? Because it's it's process now. But uh, what surprised you from what came back? Did you were you were you on the on the other and on your feet from what you saw? Is it uh, did you learn something that you said you wouldn't expect up front? Interesting about that. Yeah, does it? I I have to. Of course, things are surprising me, but there are so many entrants and five locations, so it's difficult to make one sentence of that. Um, let me say that on the what surprises me as as a as a person working at the municipality is that you um, you put on the table a problem like productivity, and that came also uh, through. Uh, uh, that was picked up, actually it was an idea of Europan, it was picked up by our Department for Economic Affairs. William Stockman read the theme in the Europan papers. He thought, hey, this is interesting, this is actually on the agenda of Europe. We make, uh, I'm going to make a, a policy plan for this, for Amsterdam. He did, so more or less the whole issue of productivity was lifted up by different departments, by European, with our department, with the urban planning department, with the economic affairs, and all of a sudden the theme of productivity is on the agenda. And maybe um, that surprised me most, that you can really sometimes put something on the agenda in Europe and did that for Amsterdam more than than other editions so of Europe in Amsterdam. If we had the map of Amsterdam uh, a second ago, perhaps you can see it again. Uh, because I was interested in why you picked the sites. What, what, what were discriminators for you to say, hey, these sites are interesting, these sites are what we want to learn from? Yeah. Well, that was a long uh, discussion and, and Madir and Jonathan helped very much. We spoke with different project teams and uh, none of them are green fields, as was mentioned about the, the, the sites of Rotterdam. Um, and we, we had to find sites where the design of Europe could be in, a, in the process useful for the further development. So some locations were too far, some were not far enough. So you have to find the right moment to get it in. And then, interesting, as an, m that it has multiple layers in the site itself, which is productivity, but also density, the social side of it, and so on. And we wanted to share it about the area. So it was a, a puzzle. Yeah. But, uh, 
So perhaps we, because we have the images, of course, uh, from the, from some of the proposals, and uh, before doing anything else, I would like to try and get because Sophia, you you won this side, right? It's a loop, so it's going it's going on. Uh, but but um, you were a presenter in our lecture series as well last week, so we met before. So what for you was uh, first of all what what did what did you learn from the process? Um. <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult to say. I think that one thing I learned, I think that the main important, I think, aspect about kind of working together with multiple kind of interest groups, but also in particular in our case with the municipality, is that uh, it's about negotiation and it's about uh, being able, it's about communicating and negotiating. And I think that that's something that's quite an important aspect of Europan that gives you a platform or a seat at the table to be able to to participate in this process. And uh, for example, in our case, uh, the project is currently kind of, it's we're kind of in this period where we're just waiting um, to get some feedback on a proposal that we made. And we realize that this takes time, but it also takes um, kind of from our side about building a kind of a bridge with the municipality. And I think we've that that has been really our uh, main kind of that's something that we really kind of value in this process about making this connection and that's something we really have uh, tried to uh, build together with the, the team that is actually responsible for our site. Something about your firm because uh, I saw you were operating in Russia and uh, all over the world and then you decide to participate in Europe huh? so perhaps just to give us a feel why is the consideration for you to, to join in and, and, and add this to your already uh, uh, rich portfolio? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, we're a team that is composed of people from all over the world. I mean, I, I was born in Russia. I grew up in the States. I also lived in Israel. Like, the rest of our team also comes from everywhere. And I think, um, for me at this time, I mean, I've chosen the Netherlands as a place to be. And I think it's quite amazing that there's just an opportunity to kind of uh, engage in in your community kind of more locally. And we really saw this as a kind of a first step to start to embed our practice uh, more locally. And so I see that as a... So thanks. We, we kind of stole your uh, images for our communication process. <laughs> so same story. Uh, what, what was for you uh, the, the most important discovery in, in, in participating? Um, well, uh, in, in this process, uh, in these two years, I learned to to don't give up on uh, on the hope that uh, something will happen with this project. And uh, after two years, I feel like uh, we are just starting uh, with uh, with the project. And uh, I learned to uh, to open a big network of people. Uh, I met people from the municipality and a lot of uh, architects that I, uh, I was uh, I used to see on websites and uh, lectures. And I learned to talk to them and uh, exchange ideas and uh, hopefully also collaborate. Uh, today I had a, uh, a meeting with a local architect and uh, hopefully to, to work on the site together. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, starting. So, so you're collaborating with uh, Studio Nine Dots yes. huh, in Amsterdam and moving forward on the project. And uh, we met each other in Brussels, so you're quite, a vin quite involved. So, uh, so, so perhaps a, a bit more about this collaboration with the, with the local firm. What, 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 what's that about? How, why is that set up? Uh, it's not completely set up. Uh, it's uh, also starting, and there is also another collaboration for the. This, that's for the big site for the urban uh, for the master plan. There is also another collaboration on the small site, with another uh, local firm that is uh, based in the area, and uh, uh, for now there it's a more a verbal uh, collaboration. Uh, we are still uh, defining uh, the details, but the idea is to sh uh, to Im uh, implement our uh, principle that we we showed in the proposal in the framework of the municipality for the entire area of Bauxelotram in the north. So Papa Verdriuk was your uh, 
what's your proposal, right? Which follows after this uh, slide. What is what's the principal message? What what did you learn from the competition? What what you what, what principle what you want to give back through the design? Well, I saw that uh, already the um, the the city uh, uh, took some ideas like the gradient of density. Uh, and the low, uh, keeping a higher density on the north and the lower uh, scale on the on the south, where it's more uh, with uh, more public uh, uh, functions. And uh, I hope we can implement this mix, vertical mix, vertical and horizontal mix of functions. Uh, I think that's something we hope to implement too. And uh, we had uh, this uh, uh, dream of a network of collective spaces, and uh, we hope to develop this principle more in, uh, into, into reality. And I saw that also that has been picked and there, are, uh, there is uh, this idea of uh, experimental uh, places inspired by something already existing, the Koval, uh, and there will be uh, uh, places also in other areas all along uh, Box Rotram. So it's something that uh, there is room to work on it. So thanks. Okay, it's towards the jury, Matthijs. Uh, Matthijs van Ruijven, there's a microphone over there, Matthijs. Uh, you were in the um, European 14 uh, jury, perhaps hoping to move to Rotterdam uh, in the next edition, uh, but we did. So um, perhaps uh, it's the best to ask you first, uh, what, was, what was what you saw in, 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 in the pr proposals from the Amsterdam edition, what you feel that we should learn from, for our own edition in a broader sense, just in general, what was your observation? Um, first of all, I think it was quite interesting for, for me working in Rotterdam and with a lot of well, Dutch people being in an international jury with people from Switzerland, Norway and France with different cultures. And I think quite some time we were discussing from, well, everyone from their own background looking at these proposals. So it sometimes took some time to get a level playing field and then look at the, uh, at the side. So that, that was really interesting. Uh, and of course, Amsterdam is an international city, Rotterdam is as well. So to have this interna international perspective in the jury was really helpful, I think. Um, another thing that I think was uh, in, in some of the uh, uh, designs that were made, you could question, uh, is this realistic? Or have you thought it through? So I think that is also something that for Rotterdam is a, is a, is a question and therefore I'm quite pleased that we're also working with some of the develop, developers that get involved or financial people that get involved. Uh, how realistic is a proposal? And of course you want to realize uh, or at least come uh, get a commission. So that is something you have to, to, to look at, I think. Um, and also what I, what I learned is that um, if there are a lot of things present, it makes it easier to perhaps dive deeper in the topic and make it more than just productivity. So I really like the uh, Haarbuurt, this one, in the Belmer, to really get uh, the, the, the people living close by in the area and the people working in that area, try to get them connected or make them part in the, in the design. So you not only have a nice design, but also feel that the whole neighborhood uh, and also the, the social economic problems um, become an opportunity for a lot of people, for, for new people, but also for the existing people living there. And that's, for example, in the Sluisbuurt was a bit more difficult. And there I found out that in our jury debate, it was more about design and will it work? Like, is it too public or should it be more private? And not uh, really get to the point of the, the, the real productivity and also issues like, uh, well, uh, empowerment of the people uh, living uh, in, in, the, in the adjacent neighborhood, for example. Okay. Uh, perhaps, Ruud, to, to add to that, there's a microphone on the table for you. Um, not so much about the designs, perhaps, we can get to that, but about Europan, uh, because Matthijs says, well, it, it, you have really have to look about what's, is it realistic, you know, can we move forward from it? Uh, is, for you, is that what you look, look for as a jury member? This works, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, when, when I was uh, part of the jury, uh, acted as a jury and uh, give all the proposals uh, a very serious uh, 
kind of assessment, uh, a lot of consideration, and then a lot of debate discussions. And I think if I look at the five uh, which are presented, I still remembered the discussion. Uh, and I think uh, uh, back with uh, pleasure, actually. I also think that we selected uh, great winners. But um, that was two years ago, or almost two years ago. And right now, uh, of course, I, I, I thought about it again. And I thought, yeah. You know, if you zoom out a little bit uh, and you look at cities, then cities, they, they did a lot of work on their physical shape, uh, uh, but now they move towards uh, something else and productivity relates to that. And I think that has more to do with uh, that they somehow uh, shift towards uh, uh, the shape and the structure of their economy. And uh, if you think about that, then suddenly, uh, you, you think differently about uh, uh, you know who and then who is who is in charge who is who's client of this and this is of course great that a city somehow adopts uh, Europan in this case uh, it was Amsterdam now it will be Rotterdam so that's 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 great but somehow um, that should open up and this whole network of actors who are actually involved when we talk about economy or when we talk about product productivity, this somehow should appear uh, uh, to the table. And if you then zoom back to Europe, it was really functioning super in the era that the city were still busy with their physical shape. And you could question like whether the organization right now, whether that still fits uh, these new themes, this new reality when we talk about productivity, economy, etc. So how is this network of actors, how is this actually like involved? That's one thing. The second thing is like it is, isn't in that case, isn't it a little bit like old fashioned to send all the participants away with a brief and a site and then they can come back with their finished design without any interaction without any feeling about like what is actually at stake. Can we talk to this network of clients, eh? the, the city, but the investors, but maybe also the civic institutions, the, 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 the bewoners platforms, uh, they're all related. And now they go out and, and being asked, uh, please hunt and shoot something. And then they come back with a deer or a rabbit and it's the wrong animal. Um, so, um, I would like to uh, share just like could could there be an intermediate presentation? Uh, does it have to stay like so closed? Uh, I am also experienced uh, competitions in, in particular in Scandinavia. Maybe it's a sauna culture, but there we presented uh, uh, the competition designs at the intermediate states to one another, to the city and to the jury. Uh, so, question uh, about Europan, isn't it also? would be interesting to rethink uh, perhaps the organization in order to have better proposals because now it the winners it's you are a winner and then you are selected uh, for uh, a design design job which still needs to follow where I, originally the idea is i think you are a winner and then you're going to continue with your design and with your product and somehow this starts to starts to loosen up uh, it's I, it's it's too open and this is uh, looking back at uh, uh, being a jury member in Amsterdam. This is uh, on my mind. Yeah. Perhaps I, I can ask a question to Mark Robbie as well. Mark, I'm sorry, I just skipped you uh, by introducing you. You are also a jury member. I will look you up. This question, I think, is very interesting, so think about it. Uh, my dear, first, uh, because you're a jury, European board member, uh, we, we were in Paris. It's strict rules. So uh, what, what Roos is pu putting in now on the table, it's, it's difficult, right? Um, I just wanted to give a feedback on that. I think Christian Boret is also involved with Europe on, on an organization level. And this is, this is a live and kicking discussion everybody is having. So the northern countries are much more open for that. And so we are, we are dealing with that. But I think there is a, a constant discussion about um, the design and the face of the architect. So, so how do you relate that? How do you bring two values on table before you choose them, which is a very realistic uh, situation. So that, that's being discussed and hopefully your comment, we're going to bring it uh, with force back there. So we had the script and I'll leave it there because Willem, uh, the European 15, we said, well, we don't want that. We want interaction, we want to learn. So what's your take on that if, for the next edition, uh, if we listen to Ruud? 
I'm afraid I can only agree on that, um, especially on the theme of being productive. Uh, you mentioned the economic structure, which is quite an uh, actual theme in the city, in the world port city, Rotterdam. So, in the sense of a uh, development process in which design can have a major role, of course it is of, of main interest to ask the question, where is productivity focusing on? What does our city produce in about 10, 20 years? Can it produce energy? Can it produce mental health? Is productivity still uh, absorbed as an idea of the 20th century of producing what our uh, harbor entity produces, bulk? Um, so it really puzzles me how to, how to uh, be involved in this process, how to ask the right question, shoot me a rabbit or shoot me an animal which tells me what to do or where to go. Um, so there it is. Well, you're still in here. So uh, you wanted to be in there. And you wanted to be in a jury. So, <laughs> so perhaps uh, because you handed the microphone to Zef, uh, Zef Hemel, uh, I take it you wanted to add something. This, this notion of a design competition moving forward to thinking of the city on the other hand, but also trying to make sure that young people can start their career as a designer. Ruud touches upon a, a, a key issue. What does this competition do for us? Yeah, right. I, I very much agree with, uh, with Ruud, uh, as you could see. But I'm, I'm an urban planner, uh, so I'm not an architect and I'm not a designer. Uh, except that I don't agree with this word client. I hate this word. <laughs> and you, you should skip it. There are no clients uh, in cities. Uh, so it's, it's, it's too important what, what we are doing now. And I would even like to, to discuss this whole word of pr productivity. Uh, maybe we should skip it too. <laughs> Because it's, it reminds me of production, production systems, of resources, of consumption. And I think we, we are beyond, we, we should stop talking in this, this kind of, this old fashioned economic terms. Substitute it for us. Yeah, well, I, I tried in, in my, my essay uh, in the book, a bit of it, and I, so I'm, I'm looking for different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of input. So for your design, I think architects are looking for the wrong things. Um, we should look more uh, for needs of, of concrete people, of communities. Can I uh, and what's not wrong about the design What's wrong about the design? So, so you, I sorry, I interrupt you, but otherwise, we, I think, you, you said, we, the designs of the architects are wrong. What's wrong about it? No, I didn't say that. But um, this, this thinking in terms of clients, of, of um, looking for a kind of old-fashioned economy, of work and jobs and resources and energy. Etc. I, I think it's it's becoming the wrong discussion. Okay. So it it's it should be far more social. Let me say it this way, yeah, and more cultural. Um, this whole economy, um, and that's why I stressed uh, in my essay. Uh, well, I, I was working for the Amsterdam Economic Board for four and a half years. And the site was 
a former barrack on a navy yard in the center of Amsterdam, a marine train. And I was looking out of my window for months and thinking about this whole economic stuff and uh, what this economic board is doing. And from my window, I could see the building site of booking.com, <laughs> right? This international headquarters of this multinational built by, um, by UN Studio. Um, um, and what I liked of in this, this particular place and what, what was happening on this site was this building of a community by Lisbeth Janssen. So on a, on a temporary base, but it was building a community. Uh, and that, that is what I liked very, very, very much. Uh, it was about innovation, but it was uh, mostly about inclusion. It was uh, about making sense of things. It was a, about sustainability. Uh, she made use of almost nothing. So her budget is very, very low. But the things she's doing uh, is exactly the right time, the right place. And it's listening to people. It's really what she does is listening to people. Okay. Uh, so on the it. table is, she said, no clients. We think another word. It's partners, perhaps. Uh, productivity, we reinvent the word, what it's about. I think Willem just addressed that. Uh, Christian, you, you, you grabbed hold of the microphone. Yeah, I wanted to react. Um, I think you sound like an architect. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, with your explanation about what it should be then instead of uh, productivity, eh? uh, I thought it was rather abstract. Eh? So I think it's, I, you know, you have this term, I don't think it's old fashioned. You have this term also foundational economy, so that the city needs to give space to an economy that is servicing the city and the basic needs of the people. So that's why we have this metaphor of the policeman or the nurse. So basic needs of the people, food, repair jobs, health services. And so that's the reason why we have this uh, metaphor of the nurse not finding any place to live anymore in London or in Amsterdam or in Brussels, and why we have to provide space for them. Because those people, they work in the city, they are productive in that way, they make part of foundational economy. And I really think we should make, provide space for that in the city. And the, Word might be wrong, wrongly chosen, but uh, yeah, I really need, or the plumber. We will all need, always need place for, we will always need a plumber in the city. And we should, we are pushing out those kind of activities out of the city. We are replacing them by booking come. We are replacing them, those kind of spaces in the city, in my city it is by offices for European institutions. And so we are pushing out these kind of jobs out of the city. There's a sense of urgency there, right? This is why. And then perhaps I can follow up because you're a champion of uh, design competitions, a firm believer in your practice in Brussels. So also the question is on the table, what can de designers do? Uh, so perhaps you can get into that. Yeah, what, what design, so, the, the, but the first discussion, of course, is uh, do we want to provide to reserve space in the city, floor area, for these kind of jobs, for this kind of economy? So that's the first question, and that's nearly a political question, it's not a spatial question. Once you have decided yes, of course you have to provide solutions, how to do that, how to integrate that, and that's, be, that's when the design competition becomes an interesting tool, because you could say that we also have lost the capacity to integrate those activities in the city. In the, in the doomed industrial 19th century city, there was still this capacity. The architect was able to build the factory and he was able to build the houses for the workers and he also built the house for the, the, the director. So there was, there was this kind of integration in the city with all problems involved, eh? so I'm not saying that it, that was a kind of good period. But I think we've lost, as architects and urban planners, this capacity to 
well, to give shape to it and to integrate it in a contemporary way in the city. And that's why we need competitions to stimulate new ideas and to bring up solutions. Huh? Yeah, thanks. I'll get back to that point in a, in a moment. Perhaps, perhaps you can hand over the microphone to Mark Robby, who is be sitting behind you. Mark, uh, this notion that, that Ruud introduced. You were also a jury member, Yeah. Uh, a Rotterdam-based Amsterdam jury member. Uh, it's not a thing, but uh, uh, what did you learn from, from the process? What did you take from it? Um, uh, I, I agree uh, with uh, Ru that it was a very interesting and nice uh, uh, period working on it. Um, I think one of the main uh, issues is that um, you really have to deep, uh, dive deep into the proposals because there's not at all, but a lot of them, a lot of information on only uh, three or four uh, A1s. You never see them on A1, so it's it's very difficult to get really into the all the things they put in the uh, in their proposals. Um, so uh, I think there's a, a, a lesson to be learned in in every new um, version of your Europe and to read not only uh, to, to, to make the, the way of how it's presented towards the jury is, uh, should be more accessible probably to really judge it in a, in a good way. I think that there was, uh, there was something that I, I, I picked up. I, I agree on, 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 on one that it's strange to give a short brief and then wait for, uh, um, wait for the complete answer without really knowing what's the issue at stake uh, at, at the location. Um, on the other hand, we also need uh, seductive designs um, only by involving uh, people with uh, some images and ideas that will um, 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 uh, uh, sparkle uh, energy to really trying to make it real uh, is part of uh, uh, presenting a design, I think. And if European is about giving young people the chance to really make something and not only have a proposal and then thank you and let's move on, but really to, to, to have a commission to go further. And I, I think that is the main uh, um, um, uh, idea of uh, European then, this, this having a design and an idea and a seductive idea and a plan uh, should still be uh, part of uh, part of the competition, I think. So I agree with you, Ruud, but we also need just this kind of images and the story behind this. Yeah. And also the people behind it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. because it's their idea. Yeah. And they should be able to really get a commission in Amsterdam and now hopefully also here now in Rotterdam. Uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's and that's why I, I like that in this uh, uh, round here in Rotterdam, uh, some uh, um, uh, developers are somehow involved in the process uh, so that there are maybe better chances that they are uh, uh, getting into a next stage at least of, uh, of, of realizing their, their dream. Yeah, so thank you. And, and I will get back to Christian, uh, Patrick perhaps also. Uh, interesting to learn from you what you when you feel that would be next success at the end, right? So think about that. So. Um, we were about to learn from Amsterdam, so, um, and we are doing that, but still, Eric van Kooi, Eric, uh, as head of the strategy department for spatial quality, uh, we asked you to, to inform us about how this European competition is a part of perhaps a broader research into the future of the city and how it's to be built. Uh, that your, part, your department is also uh, championing. So perhaps we ask you just to, to take us through, uh, also uh, using uh, your own images, and uh, like, a, like a mini lecture on how you're working in, in Amsterdam. So, so please do that. Uh, because your, your article is in the book, right? Urban Typologies for the Productive Neighborhoods. Yep. It's a very intriguing title. And then uh, you can read the article, but you also listen to you. So thank you for, um, for having me. Um, let me just one, add one remark to the discussion before, because I think uh, European rightfully addresses productivity as, as, as a topic again, and I totally agree with uh, Christian Brett's comment. Um, one, of, one of the examples, for example, is that we are 
uh, we were one of the cities with the highest percentage of office spaces, empty office spaces. But the economy went so fast that in all the plans we didn't plan office spaces. Now there's a shortage. And the rise of office spaces uh, rents was 30-40% in the last year. Uh, because we thought the economy would be totally different. So, um, what, we do, what did we do? Um, well, learning from the European. Um, well, in fact, in Amsterdam, I think I'm an urban designer. Uh, and from an urban design point of view, um, I think uh, it's interesting to think about what's the principles of urban design in Amsterdam. Um, and to me, it's only three things, or th three things would be the basic. Um, whatever we do over centuries, uh, the principle of the urban block is very consistent in, in terms of urban planning. Uh, and the block expresses individuality, but it also expresses simple rules. And it develops uh, over time. Uh, the second one is the, the, the street as an interactive space where functions combine. Uh, this is also still in nowadays planning. Eh? You see the old images, but uh, if you look at the new neighborhoods, will still try to design interactive places. And the third one is proximity of functions. Uh, we have a strong policy on, uh, for example, large, uh, 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 we call it PDV, PDV de Detailhandel, uh, but also uh, high concentrated supermarkets. We, you won't find them in, any, in Amsterdam because we don't believe in it. Um, and we, 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 uh, we believe that nearness of functions and nearness of landscape and green is, is one of the quality. Um, but if you look at our challenge for the next 10 to 15, maybe 30 years, uh, you see that all the urban development areas are around the inner city and in areas that will be transformation. 80% of these areas will be transforming. We have Eiburg, the next phase, that's sand and land. But other than that, it will be existing areas transforming. Um, and you think about 60,000 to 80,000 uh, or 100,000 houses, even more. Uh, which basically means that an area that looks like this, and we have them everywhere, will transform into an area that will have houses. And then 20% of what's building will be the industrial functions or uh, productivity spaces, which are here. And part of them, and uh, it was said before, the economy department did now a study, and uh, it said well, most of these functions can stay in these areas. But some of them will need to disappear or go elsewhere. But what happens when housing comes in, the rates go up. And some of these functions have, who have cheap floor rates now will be able to force to go, although we think they're so nice and so attractive to have them in our neighborhoods. So yes, productivity is a theme that we should think about and that we need to be challenged with ideas. And yes, um, I think it's, it's, inter it's simple to draw this, but then we all know that this process will take 10, 15 years from now. So what kind of strategies do we have? Eh? Th these were things we thought 10 years ago were not possible. Eh? A gamma on top of it, uh, housing. Um, and the workspace of today uh, uh, of yesterday is not the one uh, of tomorrow. This is we work. And offices don't look like offices anymore. And then still, there are huge companies still coming to Amsterdam and also probably Rotterdam again, uh, uh, asking and demanding for office spaces. Um, look at this building where we're sitting next to it right now. It's a combination of working spaces and living spaces. And each time it's a question, what can we combine and what not? Uh, and more and more things can be combined, uh, luckily. Uh, but then there's also the desire of uh, green, sustainability, um, uh, not only on top of buildings or inside of buildings, but also in the streets. Um, and the question is, how can we realize this? Uh, because it looks so nice, because here you can see the garage where people are working, interactive spaces, housing, um, and we all draw this in, in a way that we desire that this would be uh, happening in the next uh, years. But these are some of the area developments in Amsterdam. Uh, if you look at NDSM on top of it, some of them, uh, uh, the industries are gone. 
Um, that, but this here is AMSO3. This is office parks. And now it's going to be combined or transformed with housing. Um, and this is most interesting. This is Buikslauterham. And when I saw this uh, model last week, I saw, well, this is the, where the difference is between urban planners and architects. This is the image where the urbanist says, okay, we want this kind of typology, and this is how it's going to be realized. Because architects have more imagination. And the question is, what should be our role as urbanists to learn from this? So we started to do an investigation on what kind of typologies are we building, and why are we always uh, building the same typologies? Is my statement is, in Amsterdam we have a new kit on the block, a new urban typology, and it's probably in Amsterdam happening, and we live in a huge glass bulb in Amsterdam, and we think we're very international, but in a way, um, uh, we, we, ki we kind of uh, reflect only on, on certain images. This is the Sluisbuurt, and this plan opened up the debate of high-rise in Amsterdam five years ago. Before that, high-rise was not an issue. We are a flat city on the sides. Okay, we have some high-rise, and I've, uh, I've worked there for a long time, and all high-rise projects are doomed to fail. And then this project came in, all, almost all of a sudden. And, um, and I'm not against high-rise, but it, it opened a huge critical debate on what should we do with it, not only with this, but also with the public spaces around it. So we said, well, it's interesting that through this project, we started to get uh, all kind of high-rises into plants. And now it seems the golden principle that we can do high-rise in plants. Uh, I'm talking now here in, uh, in Rotterdam, of course, where high-rise is not an issue at all. But it's about open spaces. It, it's about what we do in the plants, and it's about what kind of density. So we started to compare all these developments in all these plants. And it seems that the typical typology in Amsterdam now is some kind of a bu building block where we allow high-rise. It's still a block uh, with some high-rise accents on, on the edges and where there's a new way of, uh, yeah, of dealing with densities, with open spaces and with spatial design. And, and we asked ourselves, so what is the critical size of the building block? What's the function of open spaces in the inside? Should it be open or collective? Or should it be um, semi? It's only invented by architects, but I, I hate the word semi because it's either open, public, or it's private, and then you have collective forms. And what's the adaptability in time? Because we think it will look like this, but you all know that architecture will invent better uh, spaces and shapes. So what is the optimal block size? And we discovered that the minimum of a block size is 45 meters, and up to a size of 100 meters, then it allows more of an inner <coughs> block typology. And the question is, can you arrange a front on this side and a front on the back side? And how do you arrange it? Because, of course, we want everything to be open. People should go everywhere and allowed. But is it able to be maintained? Can all functions be at the, at the bottom uh, of the, yeah, of the, of the plinth? Um, what's the ideal mix of functions? Here the productivity comes in. What kind of productivities? All these areas that I described, some of them have very characteristic harbor uh, functions or industrial functions, others have offices functions. So what is the ideal combination of these functions? Um, and can we, can we mix them? Can we truly mix them? Because it's really nice to have this old industry within the building complex, but after uh, two years they say, we cannot pay the rent and we go. So we still have a building left uh, and don't know what to do with it anymore. So what is really the truly ideal mix? Is it 80% housing and 20% functions? Or should it be more different? What's the max to the mix? Um, and the last thing is about the configuration of open spaces. Uh, and one other thing we asked ourselves, okay, there's this Vancouver model that was brought in, but why didn't we look at the Paris model or the Lyon block model or the Berlin block? Or why didn't we reinvent the Amsterdam building block? And for me, this is still a question. Uh, and uh, uh, in a way, we, we, uh, we all, in all our developments, we have the same kind of block typology. I don't know if you have it also in Rotterdam, but in Amsterdam, this is what's, 
within the bulb what we are doing. And I hope Rotterdam can offer some more <laughs> provocative solutions in this. Um, and it also needs to urge a discussion of, okay, how can we truly reach uh, uh, how, how productivity relates to the urban space that we make. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, thanks. Um, it's in the book, actually, right? These, these models, these, this FSE everything. So, you just, uh, you puzzled everything. Uh, why is that important? Well, uh, first of all, I'm an urban designer. So, from a perspective of what should the city do with all these inventions, it's about what can we and should we control within the limits of our guidelines. So, uh, we had a discussion later, later, Christian was also part of it, what makes a plan a good plan? Uh, it's about zoning, it's about building principles, and it's about archi uh, uh, archi architectural code. And these three things are the things that we are in control of. And I think with all the imagination that the Europan gives us, we should draw back ourselves and say, okay, what should we require to regulate to make this uh, ideas flourish? And also, where, where do we stop and say, okay, this is too much, here we go. To this, to this line. Okay, so perhaps Christian to get to get back to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, within the book, uh, you describe this search as well, uh, also the temporal part. So how productivity, and we can deepen the the, <laughs> the term, but uh, uh, how productivity can remain within the development of the city, how planning plays into that, how politics plays into that. Perhaps you can elaborate a bit on how you work from that perspective in Brussels. Uh, I surely could do that. <laughs> uh, but you won't. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I don't know, just to know on the practical side, do you want me to comment on the presentation or just to tell? No, I, I'm curious I, about uh, zoning, about the temporal part. So uh, within your, uh, you, you shared some slides, you were critical about uh, if we were really creating a, a mixed city. If we're really, do, if we're really doing that at, at yeah, this yeah. point. Yeah, we, we've been in all of those port areas, areas everywhere in Europe. We've been creating vibrant neighborhoods. I've been doing it myself uh, in Antwerp at the Eilandje. We called it the mixed city, while in fact, uh, if you look a bit uh, closer, it's not so mixed because there's one program that is lacking, and that is that productive economy eh, that I'm quite mm -hmm. cherishing. Um, I think... I, so I think, but I made my point, I think, uh, in a kind of defensive reaction. Um, I think we should provide space for this kind of economy in the city, and we are not doing it, we have not been doing it for the last 20 years. Huh? And for me, the, the first point is, in fact, in, is really classical urban planning, is zoning planning. It's reserving space for these kind of activities, because that will, zoning will define the land price. And so that's the first thing. You can dream about solutions or vertical stacking of uh, productive activities and other activities. If they cannot pay the rent, they will leave the city. So in the first sense, in the first place you have to, and that's a political de decision, you have to have the, to make the choice to sacrifice some of the ground, the land, to those kind of programs. Eh? In Brussels along the canal, we have, uh, it's, in, in, Brussels, in Belgium, political, uh, public authorities don't own much land, so completely different situation than your situation. But in the Brussels Canal area, we own some land, and so the government decided not to sell it and not to make apartments over there, because that would have brought a lot of money. But they decided to keep it uh, reserved for these kind of productive activities. So that's the first level. Eh? So that's what Mark Burley in London is stressing all of the time. Eh? In London, where there's hardly any regulation and so on, it's the market that is pushing out uh, those kind of activities uh, out of the city. Uh, it's housing that is, has become the strong actor. Housing is even stronger than offices. Housing is bringing more money in London than offices. On the other hand, for an urban planner, that's also a good thing because there was a time that we had to, to, uh, uh, to fight uh, offices in the, uh, in the city. Second, second level is once you have reserved the land, once, once, once you have that kind of basic decision, you have to find solutions in architectural terms. Because if there are nuisances for the uh, companies working in the city, they will leave. 
the people living around it, uh, the residents, they will complain. So you have to find solutions that offer good integration of those functions in the, of those programs in the city. And that's when architecture comes into the game and can provide uh, new solutions or contemporary versions of uh, uh, historical solutions. Yeah. Perhaps uh, because you shared your slides and I was just clicking through it, uh, you did manage to, as Brussels, move forward on creating the right conditions at least for architecture then to land in a good condition. So uh, it was a French slide, I have to go through it, uh, Christian. I was kind of puzzled about how you do it. It's, uh, it's these planning tools. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Can you please elaborate a bit? Yeah, so that, this is a very classic planning tool. So the red areas in the city, they were formerly something like 100% industrial area. So there was, in fact, so, uh, you could also consider it as a loss of industrial area in the city. But then there is also a demographic boom in Brussels, so you have to provide spaces for housing. So the government decided to change uh, the, uh, the zoning, uh, so the, the program of those areas. They turned it into Zimus. Zimus. That means mixed areas, where housing is allowed in the future, but on condition that from a certain level, it's on uh, for projects more than 10,000 square meters, Promoters, private developers are uh, obliged to insert something like uh, the equivalent of 90% of the ground floor area for productive activities. So you could say more or less 10% of the program has to be productive activity. So it's really a kind of top-down decision. Very traditional, good functioning, we, we have the same. urban planning. Yeah. In, in Zuidoost, in Amstel 3, uh, it's, so it's not that we made a plan for the whole city, like you have that and that, but for uh, Amstel 3, which is the, the next to the, f the old Belmarmeer, it was 100% uh, office area with a lot of vacancy until, uh, well, some years ago. And now the new plan is that uh, owners of the buildings can uh, transform but they're not allowed to, um, they have to, if they want to knock down the building, they have to build back the same amount of office space or production space, whatever, what was there. And housing can be added, but you can never uh, replace. replace the office space, which makes, uh, which is a, a new recipe for a very mixed area in the future, which was monofunctional, will become in the coming year a mix between really working and living. So, so how does this, uh, in the long term, uh, protect what you said, the blue collar, it's, it's the plumber, it's, uh, it's the, the doctors, it's the nurse. It's, how does, these, how does th your work in Brussels, what do you learn about making sure that in the long term, uh, any plan, we can protect these kind of functions? Well, it's working on the long term in uh, two ways. Uh, the first one is, uh, well, this kind of zoning, eh? that's really urban planning on the long term in most cases, that zoning plans are not changed every year. And the second, then, second thing is uh, yeah, physical presence, you could say. Once those projects are, have been built, they have been, in the, they have been created into, in these buildings, spaces that allow these kind of productive activities, because there are some physical needs. It has to be high spaces, not too many columns, easily accessible with a van, all these kind of things. So those things guarantee also that uh, in the future, productivity activities can still fin find uh, room or space in the city. That's where my job ends, providing the physical possibility. I think there is a lot of problems and discussion also, and I'm also involved in that, so it's not, <laughs> not at all perfect. The question now is, which kind of like, economy do you want to accommodate in the city? And so there is, a, because you have to be selective, you cannot accommodate everything in the city. And so where we are used of having fine categories on housing categories, for instance, or for also commercial space, we have a lot of uh, know-how. In fact, for this kind of productive economy, it's ra rather rough and uh, not very re refined. So if you say, well, uh, European uh, just stressed 
the the need or perhaps the quality of design research, um, what it brings to the table. What do we need to do to well receive it in a way that you can say well, we can move forward from these ideas? Is this what you say? Uh, what you are finding out in Brussels? Yeah, what we are looking for in Brussels by means of competitions and what is Europe and looking uh, at in the same way is indeed is uh, new and interesting solutions. Eh? So, in fact, that's another debate than what I was uh, rising on, on the kind of economy that you should uh, uh, accommodate in the city. But for, for me, in my practice in Brussels, so the architectural solutions, having projects being built, uh, also, in this case, a project by Office Kersen Heers van Zee, David van Zever, also <laughs> nearly in the promotional sense, eh? uh, guaranteeing that also uh, productive activities in the city could uh, or have a right on having a sexy building or a good quality building. So these kind of activities, they deserve a place in the city they merit, that, that celebrates them, that shows them. There's so a symbolical Seth, there's a symbolical level on the architectural physical aspect as well. Perhaps Seth, um, you you said no client. Stop talking about productivity. Uh, is, are you comfortable with uh, what we did with your remarks? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. So why not? If you say productivity is all about making sure that the plumber has a place in the city. Yeah, well, it's, it's, this is not a problem. This is not a problem we are in. Um, maybe it, it is because I, at this very moment I'm working on a long-term vision for the Amsterdam in the city. The, the, the mayor asked me. And it's a very, very productive place, right? more than 100,000 of jobs, but also almost 100,000 people living in this area, which is great. But it's, when I dive into it, it's, it's not housing really. Statistics are lying. Jobs, not really jobs. Um, so, and then you have this tourism. Uh, it is economy, isn't it? It's very productive tourism. What kind of economy is that, right? It's eating, it's consuming the whole city. Unbelievable. So I know no other way than to speak to as many people as possible in order to understand what is happening in this situation of hyper-capitalism. We are in the middle of hyper-capitalism. So, um, and it's a very dangerous, these are very dangerous times with the internet, the working of the internet. You cannot believe what is happening now at this moment. Um, so, uh, and then we have cl climate change, yeah. So if it's true we have only 12 and a half years, what are we talking about, this plumber, right? <laughs> Um, these are serious issues, uh, and I, I'm just going to stop you there. Yeah, yeah. No, no, what, what, just time. one, one remark more. <laughs> I don't, I don't. Fingers are I going stop up. Stop thinking in terms of solutions, yeah. and it's very, very important. Yeah. Engineers always think in terms of solutions. Yeah. We should not talk about solutions. We should talk about each, each other. What is at stake? What is happening? And we have to learn from each other, right? Yeah. And the professional, the professional uh, approach doesn't work anymore. I'm sorry. Okay, Willem. Uh, I think the plumber is key. We'll keep, we'll keep the, the plumber as a metaphor because uh, we can talk about these large transition global challenges, but. So Christian says it's about the plumber, right? So it, it's, he has a name. Yeah. We, can, we can call him something. Right, it's, not, it's not just the plumber. It's norm, normally it's a metaphor that uh, works very well. In this case, it doesn't. I think it's a great <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Willem, is it about the plumber? What if you challenge, European has challenged us. So what should it learn us? Is it about the um, plumber? Ruurt uh, started some discussion here. Um, I was thinking of... Uh, 
fundamental changes in economic structure. And when we speak about tourism and that hypercapitalism is unbelievable, the question is, is it understandable? Do we understand what is happening in our cities? And of course, all these container words like productivity can be understood in various ways. I think the discussion on the plumber is about affordability. Uh, also, Gropius and the Bauhaus worked on the city and affordability and the use technology, etc. Technology is a disruptive uh, aspect in our metropolitan areas. And the inclusiveness, we have major themes in our city. Can our city still be inclusive? So where will the plumber live? Do he have to live two hours drive out of the city, like workers in American cities have two hours drive back and forth? Or is that disruptive? So you have to understand the economics of land policies and zoning plans and regulations to deal with that. But my hope, I still have hope, is that designers have enough insight or awareness of economic principles which are the driving forces in the development of cities, in the polis itself, it's about economy and culture and trade-off, to put forward images of parts of society which maybe turn it around. Then seeing these images of how it works, we put these zoning plans in place. It can also work the other way around. So, I still have hope, but um, being puzzled or being frustrated, uh, we have to understand what's going on in the city and, and make proposals that, in a way, try to deal with it. Okay. So we're re rewriting the brief, right? We had thick briefs, so we're trying to do it in one page. This is half a, half a page. Um, oh, was it? Yeah, well, How many words it was three it? pages, uh, Willem, but <laughs> Patrick. Um, it's about what Europe plans should bring to us. So what do you, what's your take on it from, from your new perspective at the BPD? Yeah, there's always a new perspective. I was a chair of uh, the Europe on uh, 11, I think, in Paris. We went to Paris. And uh, as a chair of this uh, jury, I, find, I found it very difficult to, uh, to judge these uh, proposals because of there was no, yeah, it was a small brief and there was a black box and there was an economic crisis and then suddenly we had some proposals and <laughs> we brought them to the municipalities of Schiedam and Groningen and they didn't know what to do uh, with it. And we had a lot of fun in Paris uh, during the jury uh, process and learned a lot about, about, about in, in, in international context, judging about these plans. For me, uh, yeah, the, the plumber, Joe the plumber, is always every uh, welcome. But I'm, I was raised and born, uh, I was born and raised in IJsselmonde, as you know. Eh? So this, this site is. Uh, I was there when I was five years old, in this community center, and it was called the Klim and the Bever. I saw there the Jungle Book and the Sneeuwwitje. I walked there with my little sister uh, in '74. Uh, I played football near the, the Feyenoord Stadium and I lived in Rijenoord and, and we had this walk every Saturday, uh, five kilometers, and there was no one on the streets and uh, we saw it on the photo. For me it's very important that, of course, affor affordability is very important. It's very interesting what an architect can contribute to this big issue. So please be... Uh, be realistic about your instrumentar instrumentarium, that what you can do. For me, it's very important that we can uh, make an inspirational place for everyone who wants to live there and, yeah, for everyone who, who will, be, uh, will, be, will be born and raised uh, in the next generation. And even the plumber or the billionaire or the millionaire, it's a <laughs> hell of a job to uh, regenerate or to to give new future to these places. It's not Amsterdam South. I work in Amsterdam South now. It's, it's a completely different world to Rotterdam South. Eh? Uh, <laughs> and I lived for 40 years in Rotterdam South. So, so I, I know Rotterdam South very well. So for me, as a, uh, 
well, I, I'm working for a product developer now, but I'm not a product developer, but I work for a product. I mean, uh, you are a project okay. developer. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not the only one with a Porsche anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, no. But I think it's very important to, uh, to 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 have a team to team up with each other to to make inspirational places for everyone who, with a small uh, a smaller birth or uh, everyone, to, yeah, can contribute contribute to a better society and and to make new programs and to mix functions and to have a new imaginary what this place could be. Because I started my contribution to. I was there for uh, as a as a kid when I was four years old and eight years old and I have as I have a memory and I've wrote some articles about it but I'm very interested that a new generation from abroad and and architects helped me to to look at this place again and again and again and and and, and yeah make the world a little bit uh, broader and bigger than my imagination of this uh, area because I I was grow up there and. And I have my memory, so <coughs> it's about insp inspiration for me. And well, not solution. I totally agree with uh, with Zev. It's a little bit strange. Eh? I was born and raised there, and I didn't know that the anthroposophical <laughs> movement was involved. <laughs> and forty years forty years later, I'm the chair of the Medezekkersabschrijf van een vrije school. And this week I was I was reading biography of uh, Rudolf Steiner. Oh. So this, that's so uh, it's all about imagination, I think. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> we'll write that down for the brief. One 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 page. Eric, add to the brief, right? Don't analyze the problem. No, no, no. Um, maybe we didn't uh, discuss it, but what uh, you asked Sabine the question, what she was um, about, what what was interesting about the proposals. Uh, on the European 14, um, I think what most stunning is that the that uh, the competitors were not solely architects. There were teams of planners, architects. Uh, uh, there were psychologists, or uh, you know, all kind of people. And uh, that is the answer to the question uh, of how can you solve it. You cannot solve it from a merely disciplinary function as architecture. And it was already given by by the teams that, that competed. Uh, to me, that was was mo what surprised me most. We can't see how the teams are composed, no, so but, but uh, it would be a problem. This is a complex problem, uh, and you cannot uh, uh, un un uh, solve it just by merely architecture. And I think that these teams understood very well that they need more capacity in other things. So, what uh, what I understand is, as I was trying to say, we need to understand each other. You understand more if you have a uh, a team that, that has more uh, views on it. And if we don't provide the views by not telling all the, uh, what Ruud is saying, well, maybe these teams should try to, to figure that out. But some of them will live abroad and not come to here for a meeting. So I think uh, part in the answer was how the teams were assembled themselves. So, thank you. Uh, Christian, uh, and then um, Bjarne, I will just look you up for a moment. Uh, we're, we're trying to write the brief for the next Europa. So uh, think about it. Christian, you were part of the next Europe under 15. The question was, what do you feel, what should be in the brief? What, when are you happy? What am I, what's, what is the brief? Oh, well, I'm really looking forward to know um, new people, getting to know new people. I think it's very nice as a, as a developer in Rotterdam that you always spread in new, new, the, the new, the circle of, of architects you work with. And I'm very curious to lend people's eyes. How do they see Rotterdam? What can I learn of them? So I'm very curious, even after tonight. <laughs> Still. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that last one, I guess, yeah, I'm still. Bjorne, you were the chairman of the uh, European 14. Uh, we were discussing about the value of design. Uh, what, what strikes me is that uh, all kinds of European veterans, they're called the children of Europe. And so somehow, uh, there's this notion of something being born from Europe. Uh, what's that in your words? What do you think is that? 
Yeah, I'm almost grandpa of Aeropan, I think. <laughs> Aeropan 2. We were lucky to... Uh, Aeropan 2 was, was built for, I think, 80%, so a very successful round. And I have no clue what to say. No, the thing is... Um, I just uh, heard the last 20 minutes, and what you see is there is this hyper-capitalism, and then there is government, local governments, lo uh, municipalities. They try to control each other. Hyper-capitalism attacks it, and local governments control it. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's useless. And then there's Europa. Yeah, so w w we, I think w what we should do is, what, what we should do is to, uh, because of these, uh, immense amount of, of rules and regulations and laws and things that we should s sort of um, make a sort of reset and also say let's take more risk and let's use time in our uh, advantage. Costs go for the benefits. So if you would say, for example, if, if like in Amsterdam Zuidoost, if you would say um, if you destroy a building you have to rebuild the office space but you can add housing it's a very static thing. I understand it. I completely understand. But you could also say, no, maybe the first one who destroys it can build 100% housing. And the second one has to build 80%, 20% uh, office and housing. And the third one... So you also have to, I think, use time in your advantage by taking more risk, less control, and use this uh, sort of hyper capitalist system uh, to your benefit. To, so, so be more flexible on that. And what we see is urban planning is way too static for the, for the new way we deal with society. It's too slow. It's too slow. So we should find new models that are much faster, that have more risk in it, and that, that you can sort of uh, tweak every couple of months. That would be extremely interesting. And also, for so to come back to Europan, I think if Europan would be the sort of breeding ground for more experimental and then not in architecture, I think experiments in architecture is fine, but experiments in planning, in permits, in new ideas, in new program, in uh, uh, beat the shit out of developers, uh, but also celebrate them, celebrate them. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is no incentive anymore in this whole thing of building the city. It's all, it's all about control and all about fear. We should get rid of that. We should just, we should ignore, we should also accept that sometimes th things go wrong. In a way, the Belma got wrong, went wrong in a certain way. And, and many other, I mean, it will be restructured then. So let's just, when, when you have five sites in Amsterdam, uh, in Rotterdam, Sorry, in Rotterdam, um, try to make them all, and maybe one goes wrong and the other one not. But just see, just let it go. I think that is extremely interesting. Uh, I think that's also why the later Europans got built less and less and less because of all these, you know, of all this control and all these sort of uh, uh, stakeholders and people, you know, don't wanna don't wanna move. Go. So I, I think let's use time. Let's use time. Okay, so our brief is full. I'm going to finish up with a participant. And then we're going to drink some beers in, uh, because it's over time. <laughs> Guys, you were here with three people all day. Uh, the brief has been re rewritten, or at least provided for, for, with some bullet points. Uh, what did you take from it? Um, well, well <laughs> I mean, ba basically, I, I do agree with, with this point that, that the, the way we also structure the, these, these competitions that, that might be something that needs to be reconsidered a little bit because it's basically a brief and then a black box of a design process and you don't really know what's coming out and in, in those regards I think it, it's relevant to talk with the people that are involved, also the developers. Um, on the other side I also agree with the last points made here that, and, uh, and this point was also made in the very beginning that if we parameterize everything in the beginning and during the process we also kill innovation eventually because all the output is something that we already, like in the beginning we already know what we want to have a result 
and that's also something where you uh, where you might kill down an evolutionary process eventually. So I think the Europan is actually something that is quite interesting in finding like th this 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 balance between between innovation and control, but it's also something that should be uh, like always questioned in all further further editions. Um. Okay, which which side, by the way? Uh, our team is doing a uh, duck park. Okay, duck park. Good luck. Uh, we're wrapping up. Uh, <laughs> it's a highly pressure, you know. A lot of uh, I showed you, right? It's a lot of people. We have a second book, and we have many more. Everybody uh, who's partner of this edition is surely getting one. Everybody who's here will do our best. Uh, but the second one is uh, Willem, and I think it's for you, because it's uh, it, it, we we can learn a lot from it, and uh, I think. Um, we should strive to create a great product and uh, continue the learning process. So, uh, final words to you, and um, and and one co the second copy is also for Rotterdam. Well, uh, there's a lot uh, that's been said, which is quite fundamental. So, I think it's a productive session here, uh, and I only hope that this will boost my hope. Thank you very much. Drinks are downstairs. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>